me say the next part of our agenda this morning uh, is to bring up one of the best policy and organizing minds uh, that has been dedicated to the movement for Medicare for All for many years, and he is currently serving as the fellow for the Sanders Institute and will speak with us today about this political moment and our pathway to victory. Let's give it up for Michael Lighty. <laughs> Thank you very much. No, thank you. Uh, Katie, it is so great. Thank you so much for the introduction. It has been such a pleasure to work with you all these years, and uh, your leadership and enthusiasm is just continues to motivate us. I remember those days at Healthcare Now fondly. The conferences were a little smaller then. And who was at the hotel in Midway? Uh, all right, there you go. Okay. It was a little different. It was a little different. Um, so as, uh, as Katie said, I'm here uh, as a founding fellow of the Sanders Institute, and, and you know that I work for about 25 years for National Nurses United. I'm currently on sabbatical uh, from there, and um, that has been one of the great honors uh, of my life, uh, to work with nurses and uh, to be a part of that great national union. We... Um, uh, now, of course, face this tremendous challenge in this political moment, so I want to take those lessons that I've learned from nurses and uh, try to apply a little bit of them today. Because, of course, I'm asked to speak on this political moment. You say, oh, yeah, political moment. Racism on the rise, xenophobia, basically the basis of the Republican Party's platform, uh, people you know, going after entitlement programs, Medicare, Medicaid, tax cuts for the wealthy. Yeah, it seems like a very auspicious time for universal health care. <laughs> and it turns out it is. It is because it is precisely our fight for guaranteed health care that unites us, that the affirmative response to this racism and division is that we're all in this together. And what better issue to do that on than health care? What better demand? What better demand to contrast the, their position to ours? And on a moral basis, on an ethical basis, because it's very simple. Without justice, there is no health. And without health, there is no justice. And when we see these kids separated from their families at the border, we know that is a humanitarian crisis. We know it is a moral outrage, and we know it is a public health crisis. And that that lifelong effects that those kids will have will be with us in our society as well. Because truly there is no barrier, there is no wall between us and someone else because of their immigration status. There is no barrier and nurses have taught me that. Nurses have taught me to look at the whole picture, to look at the issues in our society holistically as they do their patients. This is not strictly the disease model, the, the germ-based theory. This is a model recognizing the social determinants of health, recognizing that it is, in fact, poverty and the economic condition and racism that often determine someone's ability to live a healthy life. It's not just about, yes, we have to prevent disease, but it's also about health promotion so that we take public health seriously because the climate crisis is a healthcare crisis. Just as this immigration crisis is a healthcare crisis, these are issues of public health. And to the extent that this economic system wants us to channel uh, uh, healthcare into a disease process that can be fixed by medications, that can be treated on a chronic basis for the rest of your lives, like diabetes, so you're dependent on the drug companies, rather than actually solving the underlying causes of ill health, like the industrial chemicals and the pollution that spoils our rivers and air, rather than taking that public health approach, this system doesn't. Without health, there is no justice. And when we actually engage then in this political moment, we realize that we have the issue that can be the offensive fight that brings us together. 
And when we look at that, we say, well, yeah, we can break down these barriers because they aren't real. And then we have a responsibility to build our Medicare for All movement because it is a movement that can unite us. At the same time, though, we have to understand we are not going to win guaranteed health care for all if people are still paid $7.25 an hour or $3.35 an hour for tip wages like they won't, like the city council in D.C. opposes raising. We're not going to win guaranteed health care for all if families are separated at the border. We're not going to win Medicare for all if we're not taking the climate crisis seriously and engaging in climate action. So we, we are a part of the broader justice movement just as we are building our own movement. That is a two-track approach to victory. We have to build our movement and build the justice movement. That's why it's so representative, as Katie said. Of course we're here today building our movement, and of course the Poor People's Campaign is marching for Medicare for All in Washington, D.C. This is our moment. This is our time. And it's quite, it's quite extraordinary uh, when you realize, as, as Aaron said, as Aaron Murphy, the next governor of Minnesota, said, my God, I am, it is so extraordinary to see Aaron's success. And I love, I love the, the media reaction. Oh, my God, the, the Minnesotans are gone off the deep end, you know? Oh, she's so radical. Aaron? I'm sorry. That's a tough sell, okay? That is a tough sell. And, uh, and, and the reality is, our issue is not a liberal issue. Our issue is not actually even particularly radical in a sense, since virtually every other country of comparable economies do the same. And yet it's been turned into this, yeah, okay, bad shit, crazy. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. I don't know, Cigna, United Health. Okay, you know what's batshit crazy and a moral outrage? Stephen Helmsley making $66 million a year. That, that is outrageous. So I, I couldn't, I, you have to take a shot at United Health because, of course, we're in, we're in their home state, right? All right, so United Health. They've made, I think they've made about $10 billion in profits since the Affordable Care Act. Is that how you bend the cost curve? By like giving the insurance companies ten billion dollars and the CEO sixty-six million, yeah, I don't know. I'll tell you if we if and so this is not this is an issue of economic justice. This is not a liberal Democrat Republican issue. This is about people getting the health care they need when they need it without any barriers to care. It is simple in that sense. It is simple in that sense, and yet the politics get very complicated very quickly. So what is our path to victory? in this context. Well, I was, asked, um, I was asked a couple weeks ago, oh, when you talk about Medicare for all, do you mean single payer? <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> well, you know, that's, that's not really what Medicare is like. You know, Medicare is really kind of a multi-payer system. I said, yeah, you're right. It's been privatized so badly that we're on the verge of losing it. And don't think that this budget proposal that they're pursuing, the Republicans are pursuing to cut Medicare, cut Medicaid, is going away. It's not. I read uh, one of the most um, uh, accepted uh, kind of, uh, what do you say, um, common sense wisdoms in Washington, D.C. was reflected in this, um, in the, just an offhand comment in, I think it was, uh, the Washington Post. Lawmakers of both parties agree that spending that is not subject to Congress's annual appropriations process is becoming unsustainable. Oh yeah, everybody agrees that Medicare and Medicaid and, and Social Security are just unsustainable, so I guess we'll just have to cut them, right? But this is the consensus in Congress. Do not think the Washington Post is wrong here, folks. They actually believe this. So we are on the verge of losing Medicare as it exists unless we expand it to cover everybody. That's the truth. It cannot be sustained in this system because, it, it, because of the domination of the private insurance industry and how it has corrupted Medicare and it has infected the political attitude. So in California, we're having this fight of SB 562, and I'm happy to report that the candidate for governor on the Democratic side who ran against single payer came in third. <laughs> behind, behind John Cox, who... Wow, he's scary, man. He's like, uh, hey, I didn't support Trump, 
but then Trump endorsed him, and then he came in second. So that just, <laughs> all right. But that's, I, the reason I think that Antonio Villarosa, uh came in third is because it didn't make sense to his voters. Like, why is this guy who's supposedly a progressive labor leader, former mayor of LA, why is he against universal health care? Why is he against single payer? It just didn't make sense. And that's the moment we're in. It is just common sense. It is not Republican. It's not anti-Republican. Anti it is just common sense. Ryan Cooper, writing in the, um, the week, uh, said something we've been saying for quite a while. It's the price is stupid, right? And we just pay too much. Why is health care in America so expensive? Because the prices are high. <laughs> if we pay, okay, but it's true. There's no regulation on insurance company rates. There's no regulation on, on drug prices. There's no regulation on co-pays or deductibles. There's no regulation on hospital charges, nothing. And so Cooper writes, if we paid what Canada pays for prices, for health care services and so forth, we wouldn't need any new taxes. You could pay for it now under the existing budget. So when we hear, we hear this in California all the time, oh, it's going to bust the budget. Oh, single payer, how can you afford it? It's like, how can you not afford it? How can we not afford it is actually the question. And yet we're in this moment where all of a sudden, now that it looks like we're close to Medicare for all, here comes the $80 million HCAN train. Oh, no, we can't do that. We've got to do something incremental. We've got to do something that doesn't upset the political order because everyone knows the entitlement spending is unsustainable. So how can you do Medicare for all? And in fact, I was told if you demand Medicare for all, you'll actually so uh, discredit yourself that you won't be able to then adopt something that might be a partial reform. I'm like, yeah, that worked out great in 2009. Yeah, yeah. We demanded uh, the public option, and what'd we get? Nothing. Arguably, we got Trump. But I'll tell you this. Um, because the Democratic failure to actually guarantee health care for everyone is a real political problem, a mistake we cannot afford to make again. So I would argue that we have to, as we do this two-track approach, as we build the Medicare for All movement, let us be clear on what we want. Guaranteed health care, no barriers to care, a single standard of safe therapeutic care for all. Because we have to address the health care disparities. We can, as I say, we're part of this broader justice movement, but we also have to have a health care demand that reflects justice, that is rooted in justice. And that means you cannot be treated differently based on the color of your skin, by your immigration status, the size of your wallet, your gender, your sexual orientation. None of that. And again, nurses have taught us a single standard of safe therapeutic care. And yes, we do mean single payer when we talk about Medicare for all. As, as a very short little piece in the week, but I loved it, Ryan Cooper. Um, so he says, yeah, you know this idea, why don't we just make it an all-payer system? We'll just have everybody pay Medicare rates, right? And he's like, yeah, well, you do that. Why don't you put everyone in Medicare? Because sure, people want to stay in United Health so they can pay the same rate and then be denied claims and hassle with their insurer about what drugs are covered or hassle with, oh, is this doctor in network or is that doctor in network? It's not just about the rates. It starts with prices, but it goes directly to how care is delivered, who has the right to health care, and it's got to be everybody, and to keep people in private insurance just to perpetrate trust funds that unions are a, a part of, or just to perpetuate the political um, niceties of the establishment, that doesn't work. It doesn't work because you cannot create a multi-payer system that is a guaranteed health care based on a single standard of care. It can't happen. So those who say, well, yeah, let's just do Medicare for some, and then we'll let the people stay in private insurance, and they can have their health care plans, it is simply not viable. It is simply... It is simply not viable. And so where are we? Where are we? We're at this extraordinary moment where what we have to do is build the multiracial movement that's rooted in justice for Latino immigrants and black workers, that's rooted in parity for women and no barriers if you're gay, lesbian, transgender. That system, that's, and let's recognize our responsibility and fragility as well, because I've been doing this for 25 years or so, 
and I'm sure many of us have too, and we are proud of our work, but we are not proud of the result. And there are historical moments where we went down the wrong path. We could have solved this problem in 93. We could have solved this problem in 78. And so as Aaron said, yes, this is our time, this is our moment, but accept the responsibility and recognize the fragility that if we don't make this demand, if we don't fight for what we want and need, then this moment may pass, and it is a matter of life and death. People will die if we do not succeed, if we do not build this movement in the way that can bring masses of people into the street to win the narrative about health care, to win the fight on the ground. Yes, it's door to door and it's mass organizing and we have to do it all because it is our responsibility and this moment may pass and we will not be able to say to our kids, yeah, I've been doing this for 50 years. No, 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 not another two years. We must go through the... So it's, so it's very clear, it's very clear this has to be a defining issue in 2018. We have to have a floor fight in 2019. We have to pass H.R. 676, demand that Democrats do that if they take back Congress, and then elect a president in 2020 who will guarantee health care for all. We must engage politically. It is our moral obligation. It is our moment. This is the time for justice for all. This is the time for health care justice. Thank you.